Today on the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast, you'll find six perspectives on why graphic novels are a great addition to your ELA program and how you might use them in different creative ways. Each guest brings something totally different to the table, and I'm so pleased and grateful that they all took the time to come on and share their experience and their innovation. You'll discover how graphic novels can work beautifully to create reading ladders in your choice reading program how to combine them with the fast and engaging literature circles unit, how to use them as a springboard to get students creating visual stories, and much more. Are you ready? Hey there, I'm your host, Betsy Potash, and One Pager's project-based learning and choice reading are my jam. I believe in you, and my goal is to help you explore all the creative possibilities you dream of for your classroom. I'm an educator, a chocolate cake aficionado, a traveler who can't wait to get back to Barcelona, and the kind of mom who brings her own mini maker space to her kid's classroom when she comes to volunteer. I know this for sure, creativity isn't always easy. As a creative teacher, you get parent calls you treasure, and plenty of sidelong comments you'd rather forget. But here's the bottom line, creative education can ignite a spark in your students and change their lives forever. You and I know this, you're an innovator, And while it's sometimes hard, it's so worth it. So let's explore the world of creative education together. Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. My name is Pernille Ripp, and I'm a global educator who for the last 14 years was a teacher in the American public school system in Wisconsin. Currently, I'm in Denmark working in early childhood education. Denmark is where I grew up, and I've just moved back here with my family. When I think about graphic novels, I think about the incredible amount of relief that they have provided my students throughout the years, especially as a middle school teacher, where so often students come to me with a very distinct sense of hating reading and feeling like reading is never a place where they're going to find comfort, safety, or (laughs) at least not any kind of joy. And yet having a specific graphic novel collection in our classroom and of course in our school library was a game changer for so many kids. I had a specific room that was filled with graphic novels and it was very much on purpose because I so often met resistance from the home adults that followed my students into our seventh grade English classroom. They thought that their children should certainly be graduated out of graphic novels by the time they reached 13 or 14. And yet having an entire small room filled with graphic novels at all sorts of difficulty levels and comprehension levels and text levels and interest levels really showed them just how serious as I was about recognizing and protecting graphic novels as a way to sink into reading. And not just for when kids had earned it, but at any time. When we think about graphic novels and using them with students, we have to remember just how difficult they actually are to read. As adult readers who perhaps don't read graphic novels or comic books, we tend to think that they're fairly easy. After all, the images have been created for us. We don't need to use our own imagination. And yet when I speak to adults who don't like graphic novels, they often tell me that they miss a lot of the components. I know I sometimes do that myself because we tend to just focus on the words without recognizing and really sinking into the nuances, the specific clues and ideas presented in the images that really need to be synthesized alongside the text. And so when I think about my devout graphic novel readers. I think of kids who have highly developed synthesization skills. Not only are they decoding the words in them, but they're also decoding the images and then putting those together, creating metacognition at a higher level. We also have to think about what Terry Lissane liked to refer to as reading ladders, that we can embrace a medium such as graphic novels and then allow kids to explore as many as they can, increasing the text level uh, difficulty or increasing the complexity or the comprehension level or even just the subject matter, thus still honoring where kids are in the format that they choose to read in and still giving them rich reading experiences. That's why I'm a huge believer in graphic novel for all kids at all ages and all stages. After all, here I sit at 42, still loving my graphic novels and thinking about the incredible experiences I've had because of the novels, graphic or otherwise, that have been present in my life. So before we wrestle those graphic novels out of the hands of children, we just have to remember 
Who is it we're doing it for? Are we here to actually support all readers on the journeys that they're on? Or are we living up to some sort of old version of what a reader is? Because remember, it's not our journey as a reader that we're trying to model to these kids. Instead, it's their own. And graphic novels can be such an incredibly powerful tool for that. I share a lot of graphic novels on my Instagram account and also on my blog in case you're looking for ideas. There's so many incredible ones out there. Hello, my name is Ashley Bible from Building Book Love, and I'm so excited to share my favorite graphic novel tip. So one of my favorite ways to use graphic novels is to shorten long or sometimes boring text. So one example is The Great Gatsby. Now, I love The Great Gatsby, and I really enjoy teaching The Great Gatsby. However, in my personal opinion, the first chapter is really laborious and does not hook students in the way I hope it would. So I found such a pretty graphic novel. It is by Kay Woodman Menard, and you can use this graphic novel to summarize like the first eight pages of The Great Gatsby, and it really does a wonderful job of giving the context in a more artistic and succinct way. Also, another hot little tip is if you go to the Overdrive app or Amazon, oftentimes you can read a sample of a graphic novel or have your students read a sample, and it's a great way for them to see the pages on the screen. So there you go. I hope this helps. You can follow me at Building Book Love on Instagram, or I have a blog with the same title. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey there, I'm Melissa Cruz from Reading and Writing Haven, and I'm thrilled to share my favorite way to use graphic novels in the classroom with you. As a mother to three grade school children, a former high school English teacher, and a current middle school instructional coach, I cannot say enough about the value of graphic novels. My favorite use for them at home and at school is honestly very basic, but at the same time, very powerful. Years ago, I began to research alternatives to classic literature. I wasn't really looking to get rid of the classics. They have always and still do have value, in my opinion, but my high school students were not always loving them. So my adventure began with the Odyssey. I remember when Gareth Hines published his graphic novel of the epic poem back in 2010. Immediately, I purchased a copy and fell in love with its potential to engage more students. The visuals were amazing, and the story stayed faithful to the original, which I loved. So luckily, I was able to purchase a classroom set for my students not too long after that. And soon, using graphic novels as a supplement to classic literature became one of my favorite things to do. When lesson planning, I would decide how much of the original students needed to read and where and how to build in the graphic novel version. The graphic novel made complex literature accessible to more students, both in terms of reading complexity and the interest factor. Students were captivated by the images, and we could have rich discussions about why Gareth Hines made stylistic choices, both with the wording adaptations and his illustrations. What value did one version add to the story? What was left out of each? We discussed differences in character development, uh, we made inferences based off of the pictures, and we noted the variation in figurative language elements, even things like how the images allowed some depth and some interpretation of symbolic representations. I began to use the same approach of pairing graphic novels with classic literature whenever possible, and always with the same results. More students comprehended and enjoyed the text, which was rewarding for all of us. 
So while the debate about the value of classic literature may always be buzzing in the background, I encourage you to find ways to retain classic texts in your curriculum when possible, at least pieces of them, but make them more accessible for all students by pairing them with adaptations, including graphic novels. Hi there, I'm Bryn Allison from The Literary Maven, and I'm excited to chat with you about using graphic novels as texts for literature circles. If you've been thinking about trying out literature circles, using graphic novels is a great way to ease into them or squeeze them in if you're feeling pressed for time. Their accessible format appeals to all readers, even those who don't usually identify as readers. Graphic novels are also a quicker read, which is perfect for digging into if you have shorter class periods or if your students are not in the habit of reading independently in class or at home. Your choices for graphic novel titles can be based on genres like fantasy or realistic fiction, on themes like facing fear or coming of age, on topics like animals or friendship, or historical events like World War II or the Civil Rights Movement. Your school librarian or local public librarian may be able to help you secure multiple copies. Scholastic book clubs and first book often have reasonably priced graphic novels, or you can buy used copies through thrift books. They have a teacher discount, buy four books, get the fifth one free, or through Amazon. While graphic novels are a quick read, they are also jam-packed with text and images to examine and re-examine which provides an excellent opportunity to review previously taught skills or introduce new ones. I usually spend about four weeks on literature circles, one week each on conflict, character, point of view, and plot structure. Other skill-focused possibilities would be setting and mood, the author's use of language or their writing style, theme, and depending on the text, irony or suspense. After a lesson to review or introduce terms, students can engage in a variety of skill-based writing activities and creative assignments like character webs, conflict maps, or point-of-view postcards. Students brainstorm with their literature circle groups in addition to meeting with their groups for discussions. My last suggestion for using graphic novels during literature circles, especially if you're struggling to hook your students on reading, is to choose graphic novels that are part of a series. Some of the ones my sixth graders love are History Smashers, a nonfiction series by Kate Messner, Hazardous Tales, another nonfiction series by Nathan Hale, I Survived, a nonfiction series by Lauren Tarshus, March, a nonfiction autobiographical trilogy by John Lewis, The 13 Story Treehouse, a humorous series by Andy Griffiths, Goldie Vance, a mystery series by Hope Larson. The Babysitter's Club, Realistic Fiction by Anne Martin, Smile, uh, which is also autobiographical by Raina Telgemere, uh, Amulet, which is a fantasy series by Kazu Kibushi, Bone, another fantasy series by Jeff Smith, Click, Realistic Fiction by Kayla Miller, Awkward, another realistic fiction by Svetlana Shampova, Real Friends, also realistic fiction by Shannon Hale, the Witch Boy is another fantasy series by Molly Knox Ostertag. If students enjoy the first book or one book from a series, they'll be wanting to read another, and you'll have them hooked. I'd love to connect with you more. You can find me blogging at theliterarymaven.com or sharing classroom content daily on Instagram, also at The Literary Maven. Jessica Kanata from EB Academics, and I'm very excited to share an activity for an absolutely beautiful graphic novel that you may want to add to your lesson plans. The graphic novel is called White Bird, and it's by R.J. Palacio, who also wrote Wonder and Augie and Me. And this graphic novel begins with Julian. You might recognize him as the bully from Wonder. And he's FaceTiming his grandmother, Sarah, and he's interviewing her for a school project. And she agrees to share her experiences as a young Jewish girl growing up in a Nazi-occupied French village during the Holocaust. And then the remainder of the graphic novel is a flashback illustrating a specific event from Sarah's childhood. 
Now, there are two important experiences that a good graphic novel can provide. One, it can offer ideas through words and images through a window into another world that broadens the reader's perspective. And then two, it can use those words and images again that mirror the reader's own experiences and help them see themselves in the story. A great graphic novel does both of those things, and Whitebird definitely delivers. The images in this graphic novel help convey the emotion, the setting, and the action in a way that the words alone might not have been able to do. But honestly, it was the combination of the images and the text in this story that just hooked me, grabbed me right away with the characters and the plot. And it's guaranteed to do the same with your students. I literally couldn't put this book down. So now for the activity that will help students recognize their own experiences mirrored in the story, as well as broaden their perspective. Appropriately, it's called Mirrors and Windows. For step one of the activity, you're going to explain to your students that they're going to consider two aspects of the graphic novel they've just read, the parts they can personally connect with and the parts they have not experienced themselves. Then you're going to give students a template of a mirror and have them create a collage of text and images, just like in a graphic novel, that demonstrate the parts of the story they can relate to. So it could be a character's emotion, experience, a struggle, the setting, a conflict in the story, honestly, like anything they can relate to. Step two, you're going to give students a template of a window and have them create a collage of text and images that demonstrate the parts of the graphic novel that are not a part of their personal experience. So it might be the character's emotion or what they're experiencing in the novel, a struggle, anything students do not personally connect with. Students should also include a reflection in their mirror and their window explaining why they chose each image or each quote. So essentially what students are doing is they're creating a graphic essay in response to the graphic novel they just read. And although I explained this activity through the lens of the text Whitebird, which by the way is being made into a movie very soon, I'm very excited. This activity, Mirrors and Windows, can be used with any graphic novel and it's engaging and it's rigorous and I know students will enjoy it. So I hope you give it a try in your classroom. I'd love to connect more with you. You can find me at EB Academics on Instagram. Hey, it's me, Betsy, the host of the show. Today, I want to share about how to use graphic novels as a springboard for your students' visual creativity. It's lovely to tell stories in writing, truly. But I've learned a lot from my friend Angela Stockman, creator of the Writing Makerspace, about how our culture has come to prioritize print over other modes of composition and why that does not suit all students. There are so many ways to tell a story. On a podcast, for example, through photography, with a time-lapse video or a documentary, with sketches, through a combination of so many of these forms. When we share graphic novels with our students, we show them that we honor the rich complexity of a tale told in two modes, verbal and visual. As we introduce ideas and concepts like composition, perspective, color, lighting, and talk about how the creators of these graphic novels are using them, then we open up this visual palette for our students too. As you read any graphic novel and explore a visual concept, you can let students try for themselves. So let's say, for example, you're asking them to consider the purpose of a bleed. Now, a bleed is an illustration that goes to the edges of a page instead of being locked in by those black lines of a panel. Nothing scary. <laughs> so let's say they're considering the purpose of a bleed and you're looking at Gareth Hines' version of Macbeth. You examine the bleed, you talk about why Gareth might have used this particular strategy instead of just creating a basic panel. Kids come up with all kinds of great ideas. After discussing it together, maybe you invite them to create a bleed of their own, perhaps as part of a page illustrating some kind of a moment in their week, maybe a surprising moment or a moment that they feel proud of. They start to visually create the story of their week. They can use words, they can use stick figures, <laughs> they can use a program like Canva so they don't really have to draw, but they just start to create and they use that concept. Which part of the story are they going to tell with a bleed? 
and they start to integrate it into their own vocabulary of creation. You can sprinkle in activities like this all throughout your graphic novel unit. Anytime you're examining a choice that a graphic novel's creator has made, like interesting composition on a page or how they used the gutter, the space in between panels to get readers to make a transition all by themselves, or an interesting use of a splash, a full page illustration, or a surprising use of perspective, anything that the graphic artist is doing You can then invite students to do it. So you talk about it as a group or you write about it and then you say, hey, why don't you try it? Create a little version of this um, part of the short story that we just read in your own graphic form or create a very short series of three panels about your favorite memory from last summer and use a splash or whatever. These short activities will help scaffold the way for a larger graphic expression project at the end of any graphic novel unit if you want to do one. You could have students create a graphic adaptation of a short story, of a poem, or maybe create a mini memoir, some short part of their own life in graphic form. This way, they'll already have practiced interpreting and using the visual tools of the graphic novelist all throughout the unit, and it will be a logical culmination that they can try at the end. Before we go, I want to bring you the latest installment of The Scoop from Slovakia. Here in Slovakia, we had a super snowy weekend, and the neighborhood that we live in really lit up. It was so beautiful. Snowmen and a snow dog popped up at people's gates. Everybody built them right by the road. So when you were walking around or driving around, you'd see all these little snowmen, which I love. I'm used to creating them in my yard where no one really sees them except the family, but here people do them in a more public way so everyone gets to enjoy them. We saw a rainbow striped toboggan on the roof of our neighbor's car, which was really fun. We got to play in the snow with a neighbor dog who liked to eat snow and was sort of jumping all over the place, madly trying to eat everybody's snowballs. And we went for a hike in the woods behind our house, along with a lot of other people. It's always fun in Bratislava when you go hiking. You will see tons of people in the woods. It's super popular here. And I think one of the reasons, and my husband and I discuss this a lot, is that hiking just has a little bit different feel here. It's more like a fun recreation as opposed to like a physical endurance thing. Um, Because most places that you hike to, there's a restaurant when you get there. So you can have like a little hike and then some crepes or a little hike and then some pie and a beer or a a little hike and then a coffee and a hot dog. And somehow that just makes it a bit more relaxing. There are also very often playgrounds at the destination, sort of hubs of hikes around here. So it's something fun. The kids can play at the playground. Everybody gets some lunch and then you hike back down. And we really love that. So we went up to this little place in the mountains behind our house called Kachin. And when you get there, there's this tiny little wooden building that appears to just sort of be nothing (laughs) we were afraid that it was closed but then we saw somebody open the door and we're like oh okay phew and we opened the door and it's just this lovely little hut that's full of people drinking forest fruit tea and eating these horseshoe shaped poppy seed buns that are really popular here and having goulash this cabbage and beef tomato goulash that I never in a million years would have thought my children would like, but they slurped down giant bowls of it and had two hot dogs each. (laughs) And then we hiked back down and it was really fun. Now the snow is melting all over. The city is super squishy. And I just found out in a text from my husband that I need to clear all the last snow off my car because apparently the police can pull you over for having a snowy roof. We're moving now into kind of a quiet month of work and school until my kids at their um, British calendared school have a half-term break in late February, and we're going to go to the UK. We discovered last year that taking a little break in the spring to go to an English-speaking country was really like a mental relief and comfort to us, even though we love being here in Bratislava 
There's something very nice about just being able to speak our language for a little bit with strangers, with people in shops and restaurants. Um, and it just made us feel really comfortable and relaxed. And so we decided to do it again. So we're going to go and see that pretty area of the UK called the Cotswolds and just have a relaxing break. Um, as usual, I will share about that on Instagram stories. I always so enjoy sharing our travels with you. Um, so if you'd like to join in there, you can. And that is the scoop from Slovakia. Thanks so much for joining all of us today to talk about graphic novels. If you felt particularly excited about any of the guest suggestions, I'm sure they would love it if you DM'd them on Instagram and said, hey, I heard you on the Spark Creativity Teacher podcast. I loved what you shared. Thank you so much. That always feels good. I hope you found an idea or maybe six that you're excited to get started with. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative.